Welcome to The Derivative by RCM Alternatives, where we dive into what makes alternative investments go, analyze the strategies of unique hedge fund managers, and chat with interesting guests from across the investment world. As Russia's invasion on Ukraine continues to capture the world's attention, our financial minds are left wondering what's going on. Oil prices are spiking, wheat is hitting new highs, and there's been a bid in Bitcoin. Macro Pro researcher and CEO of Force for the Trees, Luke Gorman joins us to provide a unique outlook, and we're getting into the trenches to talk things like what Putin's grand gambit may be, including the danger to the U.S. dollar, the new methods of financial warfare, who becomes the reserve currency in the end, MMT, gold, oil, and more. Stay tuned and discover where the delineation between the narrative and the facts take us. This episode is brought to you by RCM's team of advisors that help investors research and access hundreds of professional managers in the alternative space. Check out everything that RCM does at www.rcmalts.com and make sure to check out our newly released trend following white paper while you're there. Just click the education tab and then white papers. Back to the show. Okay, we are here with Luke. Uh, I saw one of his tweets on the U.S. weaponizing treasuries to fight Russia being like the Orient Express, which caught my eye. Uh, then ended up, ended up on his website where I saw the nice plug from Grant Williams. Uh, so that was all good enough for me to say, let's get him on here and let's chat. So welcome, Luke. Thanks for having me on. It's great to be here, Jeff. I'm looking yeah, forward to talking. Yeah, pleasure talking. to meet you. Um, we were just chatting for a second there. You're in the Cleveland area? Yes, sir. And are you in the forest or the trees today? <laughs> most days i'm in the trees we have a little we have a little property out this way so a few acres of woods which uh is uh, uh a nice uh a nice respite of of peace given everything else that seems to be going on in the world these days i hear you this it is a unique we'll get into it later but a unique uh company name forest for the trees thank you um so let's dive right in and uh talk russia and ukraine and as you said everything that's going on in the world here uh Tell us what you're looking at, what you've been writing about oil, wheat, ruble, gold, treasuries, uh, whichever one of those you want to start with, let you take it. Sure. I mean, to me, I think there is, um, I think there's a bigger game going on here. And I think that uh, there's a lot of question, a lot of people asking, what's, what's the grand strategy? What's, what's Putin's grand strategy? And I think it's really a grand strategy between um putin and xi uh in china uh and i think the grand strategy is effectively um a giant uh, one big gambit and i think the gambit is we're in a peak cheap energy world in other words we're not running out of oil and gas but we're running out of cheap oil and gas uh and you can see that pretty clearly in the uh in the data um and so Effectively, I think the gambit that Putin is making is one, if you subtract my oil and gas from the peak cheap energy world, the world will be drastically short oil and gas. That in turn will send the price of oil and gas to levels that will send the US uh, and, and the West broadly into a recession, uh, possibly a severe one. And Three, or I guess, you know, yeah, three, uh, that uh, a recession is not a policy option in the West because of how high U.S. sovereign debt is, because of how bad U.S. deficits are, because of how high sovereign debt is in the West, broadly speaking. Basically, um, the fiscal situation of the U.S. and the EU in particular are so bad uh, as a result of the last 20 years that a recession will put a, it will force one of three or four choices. The U.S. can slash defense spending. The U.S. can slash spending uh, uh, on treasury, you know, treasuries. Basically, they can default on treasuries um, since they can't cut rates any further. Uh, they can cut entitlement uh, pay goes, not going to happen, or they can have the Fed print more money. And so basically, um, I think- I think it'll be door number three there. It's going to be the last out. The Fed's going to have to print more money into an inflation spike. And so what I think- what I think the gambit is, is I don't think this is a, I think it, it is only nominally an attack on Ukraine. I think there are some near-term geopolitical uh, objectives he is trying to achieve vis-a-vis -vis NATO and border regions and things he's long complained about that we have not, uh, in his eyes, heard him on. 
I think that's sort of the, the, the tactical game. I think that's the battle. I think the war is about the dollar. I think he has effectively launched an attack on the dollar with the bet that basically his energy cannot be subtracted without blowing up the financial system. Uh, and the last part of that gambit is as long as China stays on his side, and we've clearly seen signs, China's been asking for a new currency system since 2009. Um, uh, as long as China stays allied with him uh, as, as a clearinghouse of spare energy, basically just buys enough energy from him to keep him from utterly collapsing, to be able to you know clear his minimum bills, if you will, um, I, I, I think the gambit might work. I think it actually might work. So the gambit you think may work, what does that look like? Years, months, decades? No, um, no. <laughs> way sooner, way sooner. Um, months, maybe. At months is at the long end. It's either going to work or it's not. And in particular, the acceleration of the game over the weekend, right, where uh, the US and uh, EU uh, sanctioned Russia's central bank from their FX reserves, which was an unprecedented step. Um, I think it really lit the fuse on something that could very quickly get out of control now, uh, because that will force, I think, it's, it's an act of financial warfare that I think will force Putin in turn to es uh, re escalate from that step. Um, the gambit is really, can Europe survive without Russian energy? And the answer is they can't. They can't. Mm -hmm. Um, you're already seeing, I mean, how long will bondholders hold Boone's yielding basically zero with German inflation at five and going higher? Uh, the bet, you know, there's some portion of global sovereign debt ownership, particularly here in the U.S., that is regulatory, right? You, you have to own, the banks have to own some, money markets have to own some, you have to have some for collateral markets. It's a big chunk of the market, but there is also a part of the market that has actually made a discretionary decision uh, to, um, to hold bonds because they think that inflation is transitory. And based on what has happened over the last week, I, I just don't see how that is going to, that that's going to play out. So basically the gambit is, is in with a system as highly levered as it is now, if Europe goes into a severe recession, Russia's already in a severe recession, uh, then what, um, those two will be enough to trigger um, given the leverage in the system, in my opinion, they, they should be enough to trigger a global recession, a global financial crisis, probably pretty quickly. Um, now, the politics can change that still at this point, I think. Um, and I don't know exactly what that looks. You'd have to have some sort of big de-escalation, I suspect, from one side or the other, right? So if if, if Putin backs off and goes home, I think that de-escalates. Uh, if the U.S. or Ukraine, um, if Ukraine signs a, a peace deal, agrees to be neutral, and you know, then they sort of work things out, I think that de-escalates. But if there's no de-escalation, uh, I think things are going to get. We, I mean, we had a messy day today. Um, you know, you've had the ruble collapse against the dollar. You've had the dollar collapse against oil. Um, gold, Bitcoin are having very good weeks already. Uh, I think that's likely to continue. Um, and I think it's broadly good for commodities as well. And so it's really, um, it's really in the hand of the hands of the politicians at this point. If they stay on this path and don't de-escalate, I think we have weeks until things get incredibly messy. And back up for a second and just explain by what you meant by the financial warfare and what exactly the U.S. did there, the uh, the world did against Russia to uh, trigger some of these things. So, yeah, they 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 eliminated Russia from uh, they, they put they kicked Russia out of SWIFT, but not their energy. Right. They exempted energy and they used energy broadly defined. Um, even with them not kicking out energy, it is getting harder to move Russian energy because there is, um, uh, there is indecision or there is, uh, uh, um, uh, opaqueness regarding exactly what the sanctions will eventually do. And so basically you have a bunch of traders who don't want to go to jail, uh, ex ante for moving Russian oil today. If the rules yeah. change in a week, um, and are those traders, even if they do move the oil, can they actually pay for it? Can they get their payment into Russia? Or that's what we're saying. It was SWIFT was broken on purpose, except if it was payment for oil. 
the U.S. as of late last week was saying they did not, they were specifically structuring these sanctions not to interfere with global energy markets, which in and of itself is a very powerful statement, right? That tells you who has the leverage there, right? Right. It's it's not as much leverage as we were advertising, uh, as much as consensus was saying. Now, it has since gotten a bit more difficult to move Russian energy. Wall Street Journal's had some articles about it. Uh, China is effectively waving some of it in, uh, but the logistics of it make that difficult um, uh, to take all of it. So the big thing, though, I think that that what the U.S. and EU did over the weekend was sanction Russia's uh, Russian central bank uh, FX reserves. So basically the dollars and the euros that the Russian central bank had, these are basically surpluses they had earned through trade over uh, years, decades, uh, were seized. They were they were frozen by U.S. sanctions. And um, hadn't they converted a lot of that before they attacked? They had not. No, they had not converted them. They they had been sitting in those reserves. I mean, they have 130, 150 billion dollars in gold. So the Russians have been building a big balance sheet of gold. Um, but I don't know that they, the Russians were expecting this. So this is unprecedented. Uh, historically, my understanding, uh, per the Financial Times, is that FX reserves at the central bank level had historically enjoyed sovereign immunity. Yeah. And so this is something new. Um, and again, this is why it sort of touches off this fuse of the financial system is now if FX reserves can be seized anytime you anger the Americans, there's really not a country on the pl- in, on the planet who's not angered the Americans at some point. <laughs> yeah. Right. We've been at war with everybody at some point. Some it's been a lot longer than others. But, um, you know, basically over last weekend, you know, the central banks of the U.S. and EU, uh, the ECB, ran a gigantic advertisement for gold and Bitcoin. Yeah. And or your China or your any of these countries oh, yeah. like, hey. Let's talk about diversifying these reserves a little bit, if they can just be seized that easily. Um, But at the same time, it's not that easily to diversify it, right? Like we're still the world's number one economy. We still have the money currently flows through, but that's what you're saying. That's the end gambit of stopping that flow. Um, But what does that look like, even if we're second place, third place, fourth place, or is it, is it just a tipping point, right? Is it's your view that it will just tip the other way and then you'll be, and then what would the reserve currency be? Well, that's the, that's the that's 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 the sixty four thousand dollar question, and I think you know I think sort of the consensus view is is where else are they going to go? Uh, there isn't the markets aren't big enough for there's no neutral there's not enough new you know EU sovereign debt there's not enough Chinese sovereign debt. Now it's not well understood that over the last two years, three years, ten years, Chinese government bonds have outperformed Treasuries. Uh, I, I learned that last week; it blew me away. It's a fact, uh, but that market's not liquid enough. Uh, however. Gold can be made liquid enough. There's plenty of gold. And it says there's not enough. I assure you, there's enough gold. Um, you know, if if <laughs> if it's all done in physical, in particular, and I think that's where this movie is going, which is they'll say, "Fine, we'll just buy gold. We'll just put it all in gold, and you'll see gold rip." And that's basically um, inadvertently, advertently. Uh, what the U.S. and EU may have done over the weekend with that is is force a change to the global financial system, whereby you've already been seeing central banks. I mean, since w- in our work, we've showed that over the last uh, eight years, global central banks have bought three times more physical gold than they have U.S. Treasury bonds on net. So there's already been a slow shift into gold. Um, yeah. This should turn that slow shift into an avalanche. And uh, if it does that, as I expect that it will over time, it's probably going to be really good for the gold price. Because again, if you're a central bank, if you have seven trillion dollars, you know, so the global FX reserve pool pile per the IMF is about twelve or thirteen trillion dollars. Call it sixty-five, seventy percent of that's in dollars. So say there's seven, eight trillion dollars in FX reserves globally. If you have seven trillion dollars in dollars and zero in gold, or zero in dollars and seven trillion in gold. Do you really care? Coupons the same. They're both yielding zero, yeah, uh, yeah. except the treasuries aren't going to do nearly as well in inflation as gold is going to do. Um, and so I think we may have seen, in again, theory, I, but yeah, you know. yeah, in theory, um, in theory, but it, you know, if you get $7 trillion bidding for gold, I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> that's yeah, the size yeah. of the entire gold market. And then on Bitcoin, are you a 
Bitcoin bull? Where do you stand on Bitcoin? Or you're just I, I like Bitcoin. I like, yeah, I like Bitcoin a lot. I think a it's lot. a yeah. I think it's a neutral reserve asset for the people, basically. Um, I, I think when you look at it all, I think I think the two most important investment themes of today is we're in the first bursting global sovereign debt bubble in a hundred years, and U.S. fiscal situation is really unprecedented for where we are in the cycle or period, and that is to say what we call true interest expense, treasury spending plus entitlement pay goes. Um, the United States is spending 65% of tax receipts alone on entitlement pay goes. So $2.7 trillion last year just on Social Security and Medicare. Um, when you add treasury spending on top of that, it takes that number to about 100% of tax receipts. So basically, um, and that's with tax receipts at all-time highs benefiting from nominal GDP growth of almost 12% last year and inflation of 7.5%. So you've got almost like peak tax receipts, um, and we're still barely covering just the VIG on our, you know, on our, on our you know, true interest, which is the interest on the entitlements effectively and the interest on treasury spending in total. Uh, that's interest plus some of the stimulus stuff they're still doing. So that doesn't include defense. That doesn't include national parks, labor, education, veterans affairs, all of it then gets layered on top of that. Where uh, do you stand on MMT of like, who cares? Let's just move some more zeros and, and keep paying <laughs> for that stuff, right? I, I think that's what's going to happen. Uh, and I think that ultimately ties back to the initial point of Putin's gambit, right? Which is, who cares? You know who cares? If you're an oil producer with a finite amount of oil, you care a lot. You're sitting on a bunch of dollars. If they're going to print a hundred trillion dollars to pay for all those boomers, I care a lot. Basically, yeah. you will have stolen my oil from me. So I want to change the system into one with a neutral reserve asset whose value will rise a lot with with uh, the month the money you're printing, something like gold. Uh, before you do that, so I, I I think MMT we ran it de facto last year. I think that's really the only politically palatable option. Uh, I think it's very inflationary over time, um, and I think that's I think that's what I think that's what we're going to continue to move toward. I think we're ending up this period that started, call it second quarter last year, where the Fed jawboned tightening. We're going to raise rates, right? I mean, two weeks ago, the Fed was going to raise rates seven times or eight times this year. I think yeah. they're down to like one and a half times in two weeks. So. Uh, obviously, no one, a, a lot of people, myself included, did not forecast that Putin was actually going to go. Um, I did not think he would. Um, but it speaks to this dynamic of the gambit, which is the yield curve inverts. We head into a recession and oil is 110. What's the Fed do? Yeah. <laughs> because they can't, they're not covering tax receipts. They're going to have to print the money. And what do you think of a just we get together with the EU, throw in maybe Australia, somewhere else, and we just say there's a, a, a sovereign debt reset, right? Like if we, it would punish a lot of pensions, probably other things. But if we kind of made the investors, the non-government investors whole and just reset a bunch of that debt, I mean, we can just come up with it ever changing, right? Uh, ifs upon ifs upon ifs of what they might do, but. Um, I think yeah. it's we're heading in that direction in some way. And I know ultimately, look, if we wake up, you know, in six months and gold's ten thousand dollars an ounce, um, that's a reset of sort, right? Sorts, right? They can. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. There's a mechanism by which they can do that, but I think that is a it, it sitting down with everybody to work it out is starting to look much less possible given the interests of the party at the table, right? I mean, it's, it's we might be able to well, get along with the EU, maybe. Uh, but Lines the, are being drawn, right? Lines are being drawn. The Chinese and the Russians probably aren't going to agree with a lot, you know, because again, it's it's a, it's this this decision that we went through in the aftermath of World War One, which is who loses on a real basis, bondholders or the debtors, right? You get, you've, got, you've either got to, or excuse me, the, uh, uh, yeah, you've either got to write down the debt You've got to write down the debt one way or another, but you can write it down via restructuring or you can write it down via inflation, you know, or you can try to implement austerity, but austerity, that, that ship has sort of sailed for any number of reasons, right? So it's either the creditor pays with austerity uh, or the debtor pays via austerity or the creditor pays via inflation or restructuring write down. Um, and I think the austerity is no longer really a political option anymore. 
And it sounds like you're saying it doesn't even matter what necessarily what we decide because oil rich nations might just say, hey, this is now a thousand dollars a barrel, right? If you're going to start to wipe that debt off over there, we're going to just keep raising this price until it reflects the value of this commodity. Well, and I think it's even away from them raising the price of, of that. I mean, they certainly could. And we saw that in the 70s. But uh, I think it's a, there's this fundamental supply demand issue, which is, um, you know, you were running into supply issues in 2007, 2008. You saw the price go to $100, $150 a barrel. Um, U.S. shale ca- came on board and sort of bought us 10 time. to 15 years of time. Um, you know, we're producing a whole lot of oil, but it's, it remains poorly understood in, in sort of, I think, the general public that, and even the general investing public, that U.S., the big four fields of the U.S. shale, so the, the Bakken, uh, the Permian, the Niobrara out in Colorado, and then the uh, 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 Rutherford, or not Rutherford, the, uh, uh, it's, down, it's down in Texas, um, uh, 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 something for shale. I can't think of the, <laughs> at any we'll rate. Give it, we'll look yeah. it up later. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It it's, yeah. At any rate, there's a, uh, there's a fourth big basin, but the, the gist of it is this, the existing production there is declining at a five to 6% per month rate. So you've got to increase production by five, 5% per month just to stay flat mm. on a really big base of production. And they've really high graded a lot of their production. So it's the point is, is that it's going to be pretty hard and require a much higher oil price over time to continue to grow that. And so you're in this, this resource area where that, okay, let's just print the money. Okay, we can. The problem is, is that that is, would require either printing or either, either finding a lot more oil supplies, which are getting very hard, or some sort of productivity uh, gain so that you can use that energy more efficiently, have alternative sources of energy, so you can still print that. So you're in this very, very, I would argue it's a, an economic time that really has never, you've seen things like this before, but you've never seen a collection of things like we have in the scale that we have them. When you talk about a sovereign debt bubble, when you talk about uh, declining energy return on invested energy, um, you know, peak cheap energy, when you talk about the weaponry available, when you talk about just some of the, you know, the technology and how fast, you know, how, how technology involves, you know, information flow, weaponry, war in every facet, there's just uh, a combination of things that are very unique throughout history. And what do you, what are your thoughts? A few of the podcasts I've listened to this week are like, oh, this is over. We've frozen the oligarch stuff. We're repossessing their yachts. They're right. Like the thought that these rich oligarchs are going to go back to Putin and be like, hey, knock this off. You know, they're messing with my house in St. Tropez. Like, <laughs> right. Like it seems a little too cute to, to work, to be true. But what are your thoughts on whether that can work? I don't have a great feel for the internal political dynamics between Putin and those guys. Um, and, and in particular, how much pain they're willing to take. Um, and so I, I think it could possibly work, but I just don't know enough to say with any degree of conviction that that's going to break this. Because to me, the key is what did this, how much solidarity was there between Putin and those guys when this started? And what is the real reason? If, if this is all just about him losing his mind and he wants Ukraine back and he wants to be Peter the Great and and he wants some neutral reserve to, new neutral territory there, then I think it, the, something like that probably is very um, very effective. Yeah. Um, if this is what I think it is, which is they understand the Americans are about to print a hundred trillion dollars for entitlements and basically. Um, uh, in by virtue of doing really relegate uh, Russia's relative power, basically sort of, you know, uh, inflate away some of their historic um, asset values, right? Or if they're, if they truly feel threatened by uh, this, what we're, what we're doing around their country and what the currency system will ultimately do to them, uh, the dollar system will ultimately do to them or allow us to do that to them, 
then the solidarity might be much stronger and they may be willing to take that pain. I just, I just don't know. Yeah, uh, they might be they in could, on it. Yeah. yeah. They might be totally down and go, listen, we're, 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 we're in, we burn the boats. Let's go. Right. I just don't know. And I'm not the right guy to talk to on that, but it's, I do think it's a very uh, savvy, a very uh, elegant uh, strategy on the part of the West and the U S uh, to do that. Let's shift gears for a minute. We missed your background. We jumped right into it. So give us a quick, uh, quick little bit on your background, how you got into this game and uh, all that good stuff. Sure. Yeah. So I spent, um, started off in investment research, uh, moved to uh, institutional equity sales uh, with a uh, 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 regional brokerage firm, regional uh, investment research firm uh, here in Cleveland. Uh, known for doing real bottoms up fundamental research. Uh, I was one of the founding editors of a weekly piece that connected um, the most interesting dots that we found or most interesting information pieces we found in our fundamental bottoms up work and married that with the top down and thematic work I was doing on my own. Um, and it ended up being a very popular piece uh, that was read by a lot of the clients of the firm, both uh, there and at the uh, the next firm where I was a partner at both places. So uh, did that for uh, 15 years uh, or so. Uh, now I guess more than that, almost 20 years. Um, and uh, af- it was helpful to clients into the great financial crisis. Uh, in the aftermath of the great financial crisis, it was uh, increasingly apparent to me that it was a much more macro and central bank driven world. I was spending more of my time doing that. Uh, went to my partners at the time in, in 2013 and said, I'd love to do macro thematic full time. And they said, that'd be great. I said, I have one caveat. I want to have complete creative control to write whatever I want to write, because I feel like it'll be really important to have that creative freedom. And from a marketing merchandising standpoint, um, we we, we kind of had a hard time figuring out how to place that because they're known for very deep in the weeds, bottom up fundamental research. So we parted ways amicably. I remained friends with them. Uh, and uh, I hung up my own shingle in, in 2014. So it's uh, ever since 2014, it has definitely been... Um, good to be able to have the complete creative control to write whatever I want to write, because as crazy as I thought things had a chance of getting, they've pretty consistently been crazier than I would have thought. So that's the, uh, that's the nickel tour of my background. Uh, and what are your thoughts on even since 2014, right? The landscape's totally changed and there's AI that can go grab and analyze research and do the data pull and the age of like discretionary macro traders seems like it's going away and it's more uh, systematic guys these days. So kind of, do you feel that still that need for that macro research? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I think um, the, the, there's become more and more data has become more and more commoditized. Uh, but the ability to uh, interpret and put that data together, I think has become uh the, the value add, uh, the ability to uh, aggregate that data in a unique manner and make it usable, uh, make it actionable, is, remains very valuable, um, particularly um, given um, the increasingly geopolitical nature of it, right? There's, there's, there's a lot of game theory to it, game theory, you kind of lay those things out and um, so I think it's uh, I, I not even I think I know just based on um, you know our, our client base the growth of our business there's still a lot of interest in it. And do they take it as sort of like okay this is something I need to be thinking about right? Do they kind of do their own game theory with the research of like got to understand that this is a risk or this is a possible reward and then I'm going to work that into my model versus like oh he thinks this is this gambit we're going short the US right we're doing a massive <laughs> trade just based on this. Latest it tends to be yeah. It tends to be more the former of of, of yeah. a very um, uh, consultational relationship with with clients. Of listen, here's here's the thought process, and we we in our writing style, in my writing style, uh, we share the, the whole range of outcomes. Right? It's okay. Here's what's happening. Here's point A, B, C, D. Here's when we put these together, what we think the range of potential outcomes is. Here's my base case. Here's where else it could go. Uh, here's how we would position for it. But uh, like I said, it, with, with our client base, it tends to be uh, very consultational um, uh, in, in, in nature. Um, and then 
a lot of these research folks have gotten a bad rap since 09, right? Of like, we printed way too much money. This is going to be a next leg down. How are we going to pay for all this? Right. And had the massive, one of the best rallies uh, in the history of the U.S. market. So how do you kind of weigh, weigh those two factors of when the research doesn't match up with the reality, so to speak? Not that you weren't calling for that back in the day. Sure. No, no. I, that's been one of our successes is I think Ben, you know, there's, there's, there's a, uh, you know, it, it, it's a great quote, I think by Arthur Schopenhauer along the lines of it's, you know, the trick is not to see what no one else has yet seen. The trick is to think what no one else has yet thought about that, which everybody sees. Right. So we're all seeing, we're all seeing yeah. what we're seeing. Um, to me, it's been really watching through this, the, the United States, through this balance of payments lens, through this effectively, the U.S. government has a fiscal problem. Uh, and, and for reasons that have been very different now versus any other time in the last 40 years, 50 years, 100 years. Uh, and it's been very clear to me for this entire, most of this eight years that that's the case. And there have been very distinct signposts along that way um, of... They're just going to have to keep printing more money, right? It's 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 a very the United States is going through a process that at most emerging market investors would be very familiar with, which is uh oh, the government's running a twin deficit. They don't have enough external financing. What do they do first? Okay, well they make their domestic banking system buy the sovereign debt. The U.S. has done that. Then they make the domestic pension funds do that. We've done that with money market funds. We've done that. Uh, then when that happens, they try to do some austerity or tax hikes. We've done that. Uh, Obamacare was effectively an austerity, a tax hike to basically push government spending onto the American people. Then when that causes the economy to slow, uh, they try to raise rates and defend the currency. But Fed did that. Then eventually what ends up happening is um, the central bank comes in and prints a difference. And we've been seeing that ever since. And so it's been this dynamic of, understanding that it's it's not different this time um you know but it's um, worked that's my that's my disconnect right of like it all looks terrible it all has looked terrible for 10 years but it's worked oh it's absolutely oh it's absolutely worked and so the key is for me is listen i want to be i want to be i want to own equities i don't want to own treasuries right it's not that i I wouldn't short treasuries but since 2008 the us s p is up five or six x against treasury bonds if you shorted treasuries and bought s p you're up five or six X, right? Um, you know, gold has worked, Bitcoin's worked, uh, commodities have worked, it's houses have worked. It's sort of, you know, to me, the question of, do I want to own the dollar against the Euro or the dollar against the Yuan? You, I, it's a lot less interesting than this slow moving, but rapidly accelerating, now rapidly accelerating at least, uh, US fiscal problem, because it's never different this time. They either, default, restructure, or print. And now there are, it's important you have to adjust. This is, you know, the U.S. is not some small little country. It's, it's a very diversified economy. It, and it issues the reserve currency. And it has this euro dollar market, this offshore dollar market that also messes with things and tends to actually make the results exactly opposite, right? So when, when foreigners stop buying enough treasuries, you go, oh God, it's terrible for the dollar. No, it's actually great for the dollar. Well, if it's great for the dollar, it's great for stocks. No, it's actually terrible for stocks and, and, and vice versa, right? So there's, um, and terrible is too strong, but there've been, the longer this goes on and, and the, the factors are all um, shifting, right? The higher the debt goes, the less high the dollar can go before something breaks. You know, the higher the debt goes, the higher the deficit goes, the less leeway there is. So it's been, um, you know, basically evaluating the U.S. through a balance of payments lens with, uh, making adjustments for the euro dollar market, the reserve currency status uh, has been, it, it's been a very good um, indicator for shifts in liquidity intra year while still acknowledging and honoring this, you know, basically this post 2008, 2009 that listen, when push, every time when push comes to shove, they're going to print the money. They don't have a choice. And, and once you start there, then it's just about managing your chips. Do you think we'll get off the, my pet theory is once we started with the uh, COVID stimulus checks, like that's game over, right? There's going to be a, a temper tantrum in Congress every time the, the people need more money and we're just going to keep annually sending out these checks. Got any thoughts on whether it be fiscal or, or uh, policy driven or fiscal or stimulus? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, 
there is arguably not enough fiscal that, that was the debate, right? Is it that the fiscal's gotten held up? You need the crisis. We might have the crisis now to do more fiscal. We'll see. If push comes to shove, will they do the fiscal? Absolutely. They'll start sending money again. I think they absolutely will. Uh, they're not going to have a choice uh, because, again, the other alternatives is, hey, you're going to have to slash defense. You're going to have slash entitlements. You're going to have to take rates below zero, which you really can't because it's the reserve currency, um, or you're going to have to print the money. Um, and so I think they will continue to do that. But I, I also think it's underappreciated. And this is something we've written about for a long time is there was a, a hundred trillion dollar fiscal stimulus package passed by FDR in 1937 called social security. Um, let's call it 50 trillion and an, another $50 trillion stimulus package passed by Lyndon Johnson in 1968 called Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, that they're going to spend $2.7 trillion this year alone on those. That is literally handing money to yeah. baby boomers. And those programs have been growing. When you pair them together, they've been growing like between 6 and 9% CAGR nominally for years and years and years. Well, when your GDP is growing for the liabilities or the assets, right? No, I'm talking about the liability. I'm talking exactly. about the, the, not even the liability, the, you know, the pay as you go, right? Just the the present, you know, the present liability, the current yeah, liability, yeah. not even the yeah. full pa- future the liability. Check. The check yeah. they have to write. Yeah. That's exactly right. The annual check just keeps growing by six to nine percent CAGR. Um, that's that's a lot of fiscal, right? I mean, because that is the very definition. Ben Bernanke called it helicopter money, right? Is fiscal spending monetized by the central bank? Well, you know, if the Fed does whatever one point five trillion in QE and we spend two point seven trillion in entitlements. That's basically the Fed printing 1.5 trillion and handing it out to the U.S. people through Social Security, and Medicare. That's all it is. So the question is, of course, marginal. What's on the margin? What's on the margin? Um, and that's where you can see moves in that, and that's something we watch. But that and that, that, that that's a risk. But I think ultimately, to your question, they're going to have to. Every time things get soft, they're going to have to keep doing more. Where I think we've crossed the Rubicon. Uh, and do you think they've gotten the thing now of hey, we need to give it to the young people? that are going to spend the money and, and juice the economy, not just the to the retirees and the boomers in the form of Social Security. I mean, they certainly did that with UBI effectively. Uh, I think they will eventually maybe have to do it via UBI. I don't know. There's different ways you can sort of get that to them. Um, I mean, certainly when you look at who owns the student loans, uh, it's generally it's, it's mostly the federal government. I mean, that's literally yeah. just a pen stroke. Um, that is certainly one way you could do that conceivably. But again, it's another one of these things where you're you're opening a Pandora's box of of sanctity of debt contracts, et cetera. That I, you know, I think they'll probably eventually get there, but I think it will require more of a, more of a crisis. Um, well, yeah. so the the larger that pool of people that owe college debt, the greater the incentive for some presidential candidate to be like, let's wipe that out. And I've got yeah, I, yeah right? That's right. I've got ten million votes right there. Yeah, Biden talked about it, but he hasn't done it right. So tell me about over your left shoulder, the Mr. X interviews. You wrote two books there? Yeah, two books. Uh, they are uh, started out as a series of reports we did that basically uh, a client, uh, one of my best relationships, relationships on Wall Street said, you should, you should put your thoughts together in a, you know, in a Socratic method, um, you know, question and answer of um, using a fictional sovereign creditor of the U.S., and, mm-hmm. and so it's me interviewing a fictional sovereign creditor of the U.S., that's Mr. X, uh, just about events. Going back, the first series was early 2016. Um, the second book starts, I want to say, in early 2018, um, maybe late 2017. So I've, I've got to work on, on number three. It goes through 2019. Uh, but it's been, uh, they've been, they've been fairly, um, I would say they've been more right than wrong uh, in terms of uh, predicting where things would go. Um, so we'll see, we'll see from here, but yeah, they're, they're available on Amazon and, uh, um, uh, that's, that's the background on them. I've got the third book for you. You just throw an I on the end. So interviewing Mr. G of China, right. <laughs> and have it be all China focused and right. Cause really was that the mindset you're in of just thinking of China as our largest creditor? Yeah, it was a blend, uh, between China, uh, oil, um, you know, uh, Middle East creditors. Um, you know, I would say it was a blend between sort of Europe, energy, China, 
uh, in terms of how they think about the world. Um, and, and uh, um, you know, it's helpful when you put yourselves in those set of shoes. Uh, um, uh, you look at the world very, very differently, right? It's, it's, you know, when you say, well, we'll just print the money, it starts to sound very, very different, right? It's <laughs> then, then when yeah. you're the American saying, oh, we'll just print the money. Right. Really? Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, and talk to us a little bit about your process before you're sending out your research. Are You mentioned talking with some people on Wall Street. Are you like getting going down into the trenches and talking with people to get info or you're just reading the tea leaves, looking at prices and how do you kind of get to where you want to be there? Yeah. You know, I, I, I've always equated it to being uh, like, like a giant catfish sitting down at the bottom of the river waiting for <laughs> stuff to kind of float down. I'm, I spend, I don't know how many hours a week. I probably spend, I, I think I have the best job in the world. I probably read five or six hours a day, maybe more most days. Um, books, uh, online government data reports, fed data reports. Uh, and I don't know what I'm looking for. I don't necessarily read with an agenda. I have, you know, I have a starting point of here's what I think is happening. And I, I think the way my mind works is, is I'm looking for things that confirm and I'm looking for things that deny. And so I'm looking for, and I, so here, I always think about where I am where consensus is. And sometimes I'm right on top of consensus. Sometimes I'm not. And then within that, I'm looking for pieces of data that supplement, confirm, deny, totally deny. And where I get really excited, I, and I, I just aggregate these. I send these data points. I create construct what I call a cutting room of, 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 of information. And then when it's time to write my reports, we publish a report every Thursday, every Friday. I look at what I have. I look and see what, what's, because I, a lot of times I'll send myself stuff. It might not even be relevant. Here's where I am. Here's where consensus is. It, it might just be, I don't know why I think this is interesting, but this is interesting to me. And I grab it and I put it in the cutting room. And it's so interesting how many times when I do that, it's like, oh, wow, this actually fits in. This is really important. I didn't know it at the time why I thought it was interesting, but it's really almost intuitive in a way of, of just trusting that intuition, the gut feel of like, that's important. Uh, I don't know why it might be important, but it might be important. And it could be something is weird as like uh apple headset sales or something right it could be anything like that exactly i mean it yeah. can be bottoms up data like that it can be you know currency movements right so like you know the pboc is loosening policy the fed is tightening policy the yuan's rising against the dollar every day why shouldn't happen shouldn't be happening but it is right so there's okay why and then right so these are the types of things i'm looking for in terms of just putting pieces together, um, you know, somebody can be, yeah, hey, Apple sales, you know, Apple sales here are great, you know, well, you know, you know, we don't do in, in independent uh, or individual stock recommendations. It's all sector and thematic. Um, um, it's, it's really just trying to divine what's happening and then where that could go from there. Uh, and we publish those reports every Thursday, every Friday, a couple different, a uh, couple different types of reports for our clients. And how do you view, I read on the site there, the you view sectors way more important than individual stocks, as you said. To me, I'd much rather, I'm much more interested one level up in the asset allocation. So maybe that's what you mean by thematic, right? But um, right, you may not want to be in bonds at all. So it doesn't really matter what sector, corporate or international or um, US, if you don't even want to be in that asset class at all. So kind of how do you, how do you bridge that gap between recommending the different sectors and recommending the asset classes overall. Yeah, it, I, I, I do. I kind of go between those worlds. I would almost lump them two together as, as I use them. I mean, I know that's not the right thing to do technically, but that's how I use them right in terms of, um, you know, for me, I, I think I'm, there's value in niche bonds, niche, particularly sovereign bonds. There's niche areas that I think are interesting. Um, but broadly speaking, we're in a part of the cycle and a part of geopolitical history um, where they don't make a lot of sense to me um, because, you know, we had a bubble in 2000, we kicked it upstairs, it burst, we kicked it upstairs to the banking system by creating a housing bubble, it burst, we kicked it upstairs to the sovereign level, so we, we've created a sovereign debt bubble. The only place to kick a sovereign debt bubble upstairs to, you know, unless we're going to kick it to Mars or something. Yeah, is, I was going to say space. Yeah. Right. Is is the currency, right? The currency has to be devalued. And so 
when you're at the part of the cycle where the currency has to be devalued, these are very political things. So I don't know when it's yeah. going to happen. But everyone's playing the same game, right? So they all want to devalue it. That's, they all that's want to the, devalue it. Yeah. Exactly, right? And that's yeah. where it gets into this whole point before of like, okay, well, if everyone devalues it, then it's my job as an analyst to say, okay, well, where's, 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 where's the right sector? Is it, is it about making a call on the dollar versus the euro? Eh. There are times we do that, and, and, and it's interesting. But where it's really interesting is it's like, look, they're all in the same boat. They all have to devalue. And okay, I want to own, you know, I want to own stocks. I want to own commodities. I want to own real estate. I want to own gold. I want to own Bitcoin. I want to own things that are going to do well where I don't have to make a, a, a wager or I don't have to take a position on who's going to devalue faster. I don't really care. They're all going to devalue. You know, it, and from time to time, it gets really out of whack. And it's like, okay, that's. You know, the dollar gets too strong, things are falling apart. All right, they're going to have to, Fed's going to have to do more. But ultimately, to me, the biggest investment story, the biggest macro theme is this it's the first bursting sovereign debt bubble in 100 years. Um, and, 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 and the reserve currency issuing nation can't cover its true interest expense without help from the central bank. I mean, it is such a monumental thing that we're living through. It's fascinating. And it was fascinating before the last week with what's happened with the geopolitics. Now we layer this on top of that. It's um, It was a highly unstable system to start. You layer a war on top of an already highly unstable system and sanctions on the world's biggest energy exporter and and you know Europe, Europe which is one of the biggest economies in the world running into uh, energy uh, spikes, uh, followed by us. It, it, it's incredibly um, destabilizing, but it, it makes for, uh, sadly, it makes for... Uh, a lot of things uh, to write about and for investors to be aware of and to possibly position for and benefit from. Have you ever uh, just popped into my head, but you, you ever had the siren song to be like, hey, I've made all these great calls. I should be managing the money and start a hedge fund and and make all these calls earn two and 20. You ever get the, the urge? You know, I manage my own money uh, broadly in sector stuff. I've had a few offers to uh, start um, managing some pools of money or be associated with um, an investment manager based on some of what we're doing. Uh, and I've, I, in the, I've evaluated them closely and obviously extremely flattering. In the end, I've chosen not to do that simply because for me, at least, it's two different parts of my brain. And so this part of sort of coming up with you know, these unique analyses and what to do is very different for, for me, at least, and it might be for everybody, I don't know, um, than the part of your brain that you have to be when you're running that money because you have to be much more mindful and overweight risk manage, you know, the risk management side of it, right? Is, is okay, what are my daily limits and what's the ball doing and what's, and all these things. And, and these two things in my brain, at least, are not conducive to doing either one well. So basically, like, I love doing this. I feel like I'm good at this. I feel like I help my clients doing this. If I overlay this, I'm, I, I feel like I'm going to be sort of at best mediocre at both. I think if I did only this, I, maybe I could, maybe I wouldn't, I don't know. But that's sort of been my thought process on it is, is just basically, you know, stay with, stay with what I'm, stay with what I'm doing well and, and, and where I'm helping my clients. So I'd never say never, but uh, um, you know, it's, it's uh, I'm really having a lot of fun now. I love it. And then you remind me a lot of we've had Ben Hunt on the podcast a couple of times, um, right? And some of your stuff, you might say none of that matters, right? It's all the narrative about what people think is happening. What are, what are your thoughts on on that delineation between the narrative and the, and the facts, so to speak? Oh, I, I, lo I love I love Ben's stuff. He, he, I think he's brilliant. And I agree with him. It's, to me, where we've where we've had the most. Really, I think fundamentally what I do is 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 find what the narrative is and then where i get super excited is when the narrative is here and i have high conviction that the exact opposite is going to happen right i mean there have been cases like that where um you know the narrative was hey that you know i remember this in late 2014 early 2015 perfect example um the narrative was that uh the fed was going or excuse me we were going to have a uh the consumer was going to boom because there was a gas savings, right? Gas prices had collapsed. Um, and so you wanted to, you know, sell long dated treasuries because growth was going to accelerate. GDP was going to accelerate. You want to own consumer names. And I'm picking up all this data 
from the healthcare side, I'm just, again, it's all out in the open. It's right there. You know, the, the, the stories are right there. Obamacare premiums up 40, 50, 60, 70%. Yeah. And I'm looking at this. So I started, just did an analysis again, using government data. It's like, if you take the average consumer's income statement, which is available, median income statement, where they spend their money on, and you take gasoline down 40%, and you take healthcare up 40%, what you found is the consumers were like way behind, right? They, yeah, were, yeah, they, yeah. they weren't going to spend more. They were going to spend way less. And so you wanted to do the exact opposite of what the narrative was. And so we wrote a lot about that at the time. That's the kind of thing we get really excited about. 2019 was another example of it where uh, mid-20, you know, late 2018, early 2019, consensus Fed's going to keep raising rates, et cetera. And um, we're like, they're going to have to cut soon. They're going to have to cut. They're going to have to start growing their balance sheet again soon. Um, and again, it was one of these things where we were help our clients position for, uh, you know, when they do that, you're going to have a melt up in 4Q19, right? In summer 19, we were heading towards a recession. And we were saying, listen, you, you might get a 10% down, but then you're going to get a melt up and you don't want to miss that. And that's what happened. And so we long winded way of saying, I, I, I pay very close attention to the narratives. I think the narratives are very, very important, very, very powerful. Uh, and particularly constantly balancing the narrative against the reality. And there are different reality factors that are more powerful than, um, you know, than others, right? Um, right now, the narrative is the Ukrainians are winning. They might be. What if they don't? Yeah. Right? That right. when that reality, if, if that becomes a reality, they didn't. What are the implications of that, right? Um, you know, the, re the narrative right now is the United States is absolutely crushing Russia and the currency war. I think that's fair at this moment. What happens if oil goes to 150, 180, the Dow goes down 30%, uh, treasury markets start, yields start going up, not down in a stock market crash, then what? Which I think is actually, you know, something like that directionally could happen, right? But those yeah. are the types of things where, we look at the factors driving these things and these narratives. It's like, okay, here's the narrative. Is it right? Sometimes the narrative is just right, in my view. You know, sometimes when I find out, like, yeah, I agree with that. Like, hey, great. Um, and and sometimes that's good for trends. Sometimes it's whatever. Uh, but where I get most excited uh, to share with my clients, it's, hey, here's the narrative, and like, there's no freaking way that the that narrative is totally wrong. And here's why it's wrong. And here's when it's going to be wrong. That's when you have the, you know, it's wrong. Here's why it's wrong. And it, here's when it's going to be wrong. That's the holy grail of of uh, of, a, of a piece of research uh, to help clients, and that's that's when I get most excited. As you can probably tell, I'm getting yeah, quite I'm quite it. animated about it. I'll finish it up with new segment this year. What would you invest in? So I'm going to ask you 10K, 100K, 1 million, 10 million. And then you can weave in. I never asked you, like, how do you position yourself for this gambit and everything? So you can weave that in if you like. But um, so what would you invest in? 10K. 10K? Yeah, that's all you got. That's your investable capital, 10,000 bucks. If I had 10,000 bucks, I would do... Um... I do, um, and what's, what's my time horizon? This is, I, uh, in terms of, you know, is this like- You as you exist here today, yeah. As I exist here today, 10K, a, I would do- I would As do, a balding 22-year-old, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bless you, yeah, and balding for sure, that's okay. 22, I, I beat 22 again. Yeah. Um, I would do, um, I would do 20% gold. I would do probably- 10% Bitcoin. I'd probably do 10% uh, gold miners. I'd probably do, let's see, that gives me a 40. I would do probably 20% cash. Uh, so that gets me to uh, 60. And then I would probably do um, uh, probably another 20% in, in sort of industrial and commodity related equities, primarily here in the US. Um, and I don't know what I would do. That's 80. I don't know what I would do with the other 20. I'd probably do some sort of, um, I don't know. Uh, so I put you on the spot. Yeah. The, um, right. Yeah. You only got four, three more of them. So, so how would that change? <laughs> How's your brain changed now? You go to hundred K same allocation. Or are you starting to add other pieces? You know, I, I probably keep, you know, especially this week, 
Yeah. I probably keep that allocation or I keep the, you know, I probably bump the gold up 5% maybe, or maybe I bump the gold miners up 5% and I bump the cash up probably 10 or 15% uh, just to maintain that optionality. Um, because again, I, I, to me, so that work, yeah, works out. I would probably have, you know, 20% gold, probably 30% cash, probably 10%, maybe 15% Bitcoin. Um, even though that, your thesis is that cash is going to get devalued. Yeah. Even though I can't, absolutely. Because really when you look at currency system transitions, we, there's this great chart by uh, my friend Dan Oliver at Mermican Capital, brilliant guy. And it shows um, the price of gold overall and then the month over month moves in the price of gold in Weimar, Germany, in German Reichsmarks from 1918 to 1923, right? So this is one of the great hyperinflations of all time. Yeah. Currency goes to zero, right? Gold goes to a trillion Reichsmarks uh, in a little over three years, really. Um, now, you would think that the right trade is, is borrow as much as you can and buy gold. Yeah. And that's what the overall chart. Now, for, for a while, I actually thought that. But then this chart from Dan was so enlightening because you look at it. The volatility was so face peeling. You would have lost all if you're levered gold in the, one of the great hyperinflations of all time. Yeah, wiped out. You got wiped out four or five or six times because mm. it's such a political thing of, you know, hey, the Fed's going to QT. Oh, oops, not. No, the Fed's going to Q. You know, the underlying trend is very clear, but this political dynamic of, you know, there were five or six times where people dumped gold to buy Reichsmarks in Germany as the currency was dying, literally dying. Now, I'm not saying that the dollar is going to be the German Reichsmark. I don't think we're hyperinflated. And like that, extremes inform the means. I'm simply saying, for me, pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered, right? Yeah. I have no visibility on this political process. There is a way where they de-escalate and, uh, you know, gold goes down, Bitcoin goes down. You know, I still think there's some structural stuff where in commodities are going to be probably a really good place to be. That gives me some, some optionality. I, I, I'm not, a, I don't trade my own stuff a lot. Um, you know, I, I would, if I did, I would consider probably having a tail piece. Maybe I would take 3% of that, 2% of that and, and, and sort of rolling, maybe not even that much, one to 2% and just yeah. rolling uh, calls on like equity volatility or things like that as my hedge. Um, now you're talking my language. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, then my last one is at a hundred million. We'll jump up to a hundred million. So where does your, where does your mind change? Yeah, that, at changes, yeah, that changes a bit. Um, then I think you have, once you start getting these really big numbers, then I think you have to start thinking about um, politically acceptable inflation hedges and politically unacceptable inflation hedges. Mm. What do you mean and, by that? Yeah. Uh, I think you want to own, you know, if I have a hundred million dollars, I probably put, I, I probably put 10 to 15 million, maybe 20 million still in physical bullion. But I, I, geographically see i have some here i have some in Switzerland, yeah, yeah, yeah. i have some in singapore um i probably also still have 10 percent in bitcoin but then i have to start thinking about um those are i i would call gold and bitcoin i would call those politically unacceptable inflation hedges there's those are things central bankers hate policymakers hate they make them look bad right they, these are yeah. at well, so you're are, a bet against them. Yeah. There are right. There are these are these are assets that they don't like to see go up, and and you, there are things you could see. Um, there will be there, there's possible you would see state attacks against them in in you know de facto or outright, um, and so then you think about things at that level of wealth of what are politically acceptable inflation hedges, right? It's the house in San Tropez, uh, you know, yeah, lake yeah. houses, you know, things that unless you're Russian, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> if you're Russian, you know, or if you're a Canadian trucker, right? Like, you know, yeah, <laughs> right. Whoop, sorry. You know, you whoop, went off sides. We're taking your house. Right. Exactly. And that's what I mean about sort of political, you know, it's right. It's, 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 it's uh, champagne problems, uptown problems of trying to figure out how you structure yourself that way to avoid that. But Real estate, I, I think you'd probably have, you know, 20 million gold, 10 million Bitcoin. I got 70 million left. 
I probably have 10 million in, in, in uh, I, I probably have, uh, so 30, 70 million left. I probably would have uh, 40, I, I would have uh, 30, I would have 20% in cash still. I would still have that 20% in cash. So now I'm at 50 mil. Uh, I would take probably the remaining 30 or 35 mil, and I would have them in some sort of diversified um, uh, array of industrial commodity and probably some some big cap cartel like names, right? And you know, yeah. Facebook, Google, Amazon, um, uh, that type of stuff. And then I would take the balance, and I would have sort of these what I would call. Um, Bitcoin or gold like uh, real estates, right? Real estate properties, right? Where they are, you know, ir irreplaceable, unique, finite, you know, lake houses, oceanfront houses, you know, real estate centric things where there is a pretty good liquid market for me to sell, right? Um, in, in politically safe uh, domicile. London, and 25 you know, feet above sea level so you don't get washed out. So you didn't get washed out. Exactly. Right. So Vail, London, um, you know, uh, maybe Miami, maybe Miami. It's, it's the Homestead Act is a nice thing to have in yeah. Florida. Right. Um, these, these, these are, these are again, uptown problems you have to think of when you got a hundred million in the bank. And then you, on the Bitcoin piece, just to finish off, like, what are your thoughts here of, we're basically saying, Hey, you got to turn over the Russians and the exchanges are pushing back a little. I didn't see what news came out of that today, but um do you think that breaks bitcoin or that's good for like what what's the end result there in your mind i'm waiting to see them do that i think they probably will ultimately i think u.s authorities have to be very very careful with this because there's really nothing they can do about bitcoin they can they can shut the on and off ramps they absolutely can do that and so i think for the bitcoin that's why the scale of it like 10 percent for me at that size especially is more than enough to hedge you know, catastrophe in, yeah. you know, and if gold doesn't work, but Bitcoin does that kind of a thing. Right. Okay. Uh, but it's also not so big. I think you have to scale Bitcoin positions now based on the world as it exists now versus even two, three weeks ago of the authorities could say, that's it. We're not letting you have Bitcoin. We're shutting the on and off ramps. We're not going to chase you down. We're not going to track addresses, but you just, you know, you need to be comfortable with that amount of money ain't going to move for, 10 years, 20 years, uh, you know, like they did with gold, right? They, it was illegal for American citizens to own gold from 33 to 74. So yeah. excuse me, I think they could do something like that again. But when I say they have to be careful, once Erdogan in, in Turkey started going after dollars, started going after gold, that's a sign. That's like a starting gun. That's admitting you have a problem. So it's this fine line between we want to fight anim on any money laundering, know your, know your client, you know, the AML KYC stuff. They got to do that. I understand that. I respect that. There's a fine line between that and between trying to defend your currency and tipping, you know, yelling, which, which can be like yelling fire in a crowded theater, right? Mm -hmm. Of, Hey, you know, Bitcoin's bad. And, and look, the other thing too is the dollars, the global reserve currency. The dollar's job is to have an open capital account. You start shutting capital accounts to trillion dollar assets. Yeah. No you're going to find some other reserve currency. And that's why I think it's important to maintain that diversification of gold, Bitcoin, politically acceptable inflation hedges, uh, because and, and then to keep your leverage low. Right. Per my point is, is I, I at this point, especially post COVID, especially now with this war. I think the end game is increasingly clear. It's increasingly upon us. They're going to have to inflate. You want to be there. You just got to get there, right? You have to manage your chips in a way without too much leverage to make sure that, you know, look, if, if, if we have a crash, you don't want to get wiped out because you're levered. You just want to be, because they're going to have to come support it unless they're going to be willing to default on sovereign debt, in which case, you know, half of your assets can go away. The gold and the Bitcoin are going to more than offset anything you lose in things like equities, et cetera. Love it. Uh, we came full circle to the end game. Back to Grant William. Um, well, that was fun, Luke. Any last thoughts? Tell everyone uh, where they can get the book. You already said Amazon, the website where they can sign up for your stuff. Absolutely. We uh, Books are on Amazon and, and uh, you can find us at FFTT-LLC.com. Frank, Frank, Tom, Tom-LLC.com. 
uh, updates on what we're up to, uh, different research product offerings at the institutional and mass market level. And uh, I've got an active Twitter feed, uh, as you alluded to before, at Luke Groman, L-U-K-E. G-R-O-M-E-N. Awesome. We'll put that all in the show notes for everybody. And I appreciate it. That was fun, Luke. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. It was great talking to you, Jeff. I appreciate it. You've been listening to The Derivative. Links from this episode will be in the episode description of this channel. Follow us on Twitter at RCM Alts and visit our website to read our blog or subscribe to our newsletter at rcmalts.com. If you liked our show, introduce a friend and show them how to subscribe. And be sure to leave comments. We'd love to hear from you. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of RCM Alternatives, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits, and listeners are reminded that managed futures, commodity trading, and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors.